Hey guys, welcome to Whiskey on the West Coast. My name is Matt. Today we're going to be talking about tasting and reviewing Ben Romick 10 year old. Now, Ben Romick 10 year old is a Speyside single malt scotch whiskey. Uh, the distillery itself was founded in 1898 and currently it's owned by uh, independent bottlers Gordon and McPhail, who themselves were actually founded three years earlier in 1895. Uh, now, Gordon and McPhail is a uh, family-owned company, um, and as such, that means Benromic is a family-owned distillery, one of the few um, in Scotland, uh, among uh, with the likes of Glenfarclas, Springbank, and a few others. Most are owned by uh, different uh, corporations and conglomerates, right? Uh, like Diageo, for example, uh, and Beam Suntory, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, family-owned distillery. Uh, it's kind of had a turbulent past of, of, of closures. Uh, in particular, in 1983, it closed. And then sometime after that, it was mothballed. It was actually used for spare parts. So um, the, the company that owned it at the time actually stripped a lot of the distillery away, uh, including the stills, and all that actually remained at that point were the washbacks. However, as I mentioned, Gordon McPhail now owns Ben Romick Distillery. And in, uh, they bought the company in 1993, uh, the distillery, sorry, in 1993, uh, and set about restoring it. Uh, and so they did a full refurbishing, um, and in 1998, uh, a full 100 years after it first opened, uh, Ben Romick uh, produced its first spirit uh, since 1983. Uh, so that's pretty cool. It's known for as sort of like an old school style uh, space side, so it's not going to be the the you know like light and floral and fruity uh, sort of thing. It's got quite a bit more heft to it, uh, which I think gives it a lot a lot of character. Um, they're really committed to doing things in an old school way. Uh, most of the equipment, actually, if not all of it, it is, is not automated. Uh, some of it, uh, like their uh, mill, uh, their uh, mill is from the early 20th century. Uh, the washbacks, I believe, are over 65 years old. Um, so, and those are wooden washbacks too, so uh, <laughs> they've been through some things. Um, so again, they're really uh, dedicated to uh, just an old fashioned way of doing things. A lot of hands-on stuff, because it's not computerized. We have quite a small distillery team too. Uh, I read an article recently, it was about 15 people and three of them were directly involved with actually producing the spirit. All these sorts of things I'm mentioning here um, remind me of another distillery that does things kind of an old fashioned way uh, with a small team uh, using older equipment, uh, not computerized, not automated. A lot of people are referring to Ben Romick as the, the spring bank of Speyside. I guess we should be careful by mentioning sorts of things because spring bank is really hard to get right now because it's really, really good. Um, and I don't really want Ben Romick to, to fly off the shelves. So maybe we should pump the brakes a little bit on the spring bank of Speyside talk. However, um, again, the similarities are glaring um, and that extends to how much of it is made uh, there's about 700,000 liters per annum of Benaromic uh, produced. Comparing that to Springbank, uh, 750,000 uh, liters per annum. So actually just a little bit less Benaromic every year. Um, on top of that, um, you have wooden washbacks. You have long fermentation times. I think somewhere is between 70 and 120 hours for Benaromic. You have a moderately peated distillate, uh, moderate to lightly peated. Uh, even cask makeup is kind of similar for the 10 year olds. You're talking 80% ex-bourbon, 20% Oloroso sherry uh, on the Benaromic. I think for Spring Bank 10, it's usually somewhere around 60% ex-bourbon and 40% um, ex-sherry of some sort. So again, a lot of similarities. Um, on top of that, I find, especially with the single casts and maybe some more heavily peated Benaromics, you get um, an industrial note, which I find in, uh, in, in spring banks. So again, similarities are glaring. Uh, on top of this, um, 
one of the hallmarks of Gordon and McPhail is, is a great cask management program. Uh, so Ben Romick, they're very proudly advertised on the label. Um, it's uh, made with exclusively first fill casks. Uh, so no second, third, fourth fills. And, you know, second fill cask yeah, and refill casks, they can be great. Um, however, um, first fill casks uh, are usually a, a hallmark of quality, uh, especially when you're talking about Gordon McPhail. So some of the vital stats on uh, a whiskey like this. Um, we've got uh, 43% uh, and it's natural color. However, at 43%, uh, it is chill filtered, so they have um, stripped some of those uh, some of those oils uh, and some of the fats out of the uh, the whiskey uh, for presentation purposes. Um, that's one of the areas where this deviates from Springbank. Springbank everything is forty six percent, so a big difference there on the core range. Um, they use Dunnage warehouses to store uh, Ben Romick, and um, on top of that, uh, they're Oloroso. Uh, sherry casks. I believe they're using seasoned casks now, but they season them for quite some time, uh, uh, up to about three years. So again, um, the cask management program at Gordon McPhail is just is exceptional. Um, on the branding front, they recently went through a, a branding change. They went from kind of a uh, script uh, sort of style with a kind of a classy kind of see-through bottle. It's now this red and white label and they've actually gotten a lot of flack for it. I kind of like it. Um, it's really it's really just referencing the look of the distillery. They got whitewashed walls on the distillery and then they have this giant red uh, smokestack um, or chimney, uh, much like the top of the, the bottleneck here. I don't mind it. For some reason, every review I've read of Ben Romick references the awful branding. Eh, I'm more concerned with what's inside the bottle. So on that note, uh, we should get to uh, nosing, tasting, and uh, talking about what we think about this whiskey. Oh. So on the nose, you get uh, a light, light presence of, of peat smoke. And intermingled with that, uh, nicely um, infused uh, is a lot of fruit. It's almost like smoked fruit. So there's raisins. Um, there is somewhat like overripe apples, like apples that have just started to go a little bit soft. It's a dense nose. like. There's more complexity to that nose than you'd expect with such a low ABV. There's some leather and again, raisin. Some pear. A bit of spice and vanilla. And a touch of minerality. And then just, just at the end there, I pick up a slight industrial note, um, which is what really made like, appealed to me about this whiskey, because again, it was like, oh, could this be just a little bit like spring All right, I'm gonna take a sip. So it's got decent body. Um, it, it's not thin. It's not particularly oily or viscous. Uh, again, that ABV is working against it at 43%. I would love to see that bumped up a bit. Some sweet, sweet dried fruits, almost like um, a fruit leather, like the, the ones you get in like your lunch bags <laughs> in uh, grade school. Uh, so maybe like that um, dried apricot, uh, that sort of thing. The smoke, uh, the peat, uh, it's kind of, it, I don't want to say it's a, an earthy peat, but it's um, it's got a certain richness and a little bit of dirtiness to it. Um, and it's actually a lot more present than the nose would make you think. Mm. 
-hmm. Milk and chocolate, uh, milk chocolate and orange, like um, a Terry's chocolate orange. Got ahead of myself there. Mm. Yeah, the orange is really prominent now. There's some toffee in there too. Just talk about the finish right now because that's what I'm getting right this moment. Um, moderate finish. It, it, it doesn't resolve too quickly. Uh, it sticks around. Um, honestly, and we'll talk about value a little bit. It's, it's a better finish than we deserve for the price of this whiskey. Um, it's punching uh, a little bit above its weight. There's some malt, a bit of oak, um, and, and some peat smoke just resolving. Um, still still tasting it, still going. So um, really charitable finish um, for the, the price you pay for this bottle. A light touch of spice. I wouldn't say there's any peppering. It's more of um, oh, maybe sort of like a, a, a nutmeg, like a, just just a light touch and a toffee. Yeah, surprising depth of flavor again for something at forty three percent. There's not a lot of whiskeys I just will fanboy over that are under 46 percent um spoiler this may be one of them and on that finish again what i mentioned earlier with the oak um with the the, the malt um there's a richness maybe a, a bit of that leather transferring through um and then sort of a, like a spent ash like a campfire at 2 a.m just the charcoal like the the yeah just spent campfire ash um a fire that just kind of burnt itself out and it's just you, you get the remnants of off in the distance all right last sip and then we'll talk about value and give it a mark mm. this whiskey is dangerously drinkable super super quaffable um i I have to confess that when I was salmon fishing this season, uh, this is what I would bring with me to pour for other salmon fish fishermen on the river. Um, I feel like it's a crowd pleaser. It has a little bit of everything. Uh, it's very well balanced. Uh, you get fruit, you get uh, some dessert tones with like the toffee and some vanilla, the uh, milk chocolate. And again, you've got the fruity notes with the orange and the like uh, fruit leather dried apricot in the nose with the apple and the pear um, and you and that peat just kind of brings it all together it just ties it up with a nice uh, neat little bow it's it's really a, a great whiskey um, for what it is the negative it could be so much better Ben Romick why why are you bottling at 43 percent Gordon and McPhail you're moving all your products up to at least 46%. Please do the same with Ben Romick. I feel like the whiskey community as a whole is ready for it. I don't think you're going to alienate with anybody with it. An extra 3% I don't think will turn people off from this whiskey. And there'd just be that much more body. I feel like there would be that much more flavor. And the finish would last that much longer. Uh, the value on the bottle, uh, I paid just over $50 for my bottle. It's regularly available in British Columbia for around $65. And again, the same across Canada. Like I said before in other videos, cheaper elsewhere, I'm sure. Uh, so as such, it's a great value proposition. Uh, better at 46%, uh, still great value. It's a characterful dram. Uh, I'm going to give this 86 out of 100. It's a really solid mark, and again, for between fifty and sixty-five dollars in that range, it's uh, this is my second bottle of it, and I'm gonna keep going through bottles when I um, finish this one. I'll replace it. It's good, even better, 
are benromic single casks. If you can get your hands on some benromic single casks, they are dynamite. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. I've got uh, a couple that uh, I'll review in the future. Uh, until then, thanks for uh, watching the video. Uh, if you could like, share, uh, subscribe, um, it really helps the channel. And uh, until next time, slunch it.